Welcome back into the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap, presented by Full Press Coverage. The NBA season is rapidly approaching. We're about a month away now, and uh, training camps are approaching even faster than that. But the big story this offseason remains the vastly and rapidly deteriorating situation in Philadelphia between the 76ers and Ben Simmons. Sap, we've spent a lot of time on this show talking about it. We've spent a lot of time on the show ripping on Ben Simmons and the way the Sixers have handled the situation. Now it seems more like uh, Ben Simmons has sort of seized control of the situation in a negative form. He is dead set on getting traded from Philadelphia, so much so that he is not going to report to camp. And the team is saying, well, if you don't report to camp, we're going to fine you. We're going to withhold salary. It's getting ugly really fast here, Sap. Are you surprised at all with how quickly this has gone downhill? No, I'm not at all. I mean, again, I think the Philadelphia 76ers have themselves to blame, uh, notably head coach Doc Rivers and star center Joel Embiid, who basically threw him under the bus after the Game 7 loss to the Atlanta Hawks in the Eastern Conference semifinals. I mean, and we know Simmons is a very sensitive guy. Uh, wrong city to be a sensitive athlete. And I think a couple of weeks ago when we compared – NFL quarterbacks, to NBA stars, you nailed it with Ben Simmons and Carson Wentz. I mean, it's perfect. And Carson Wentz got moved to Indianapolis and is already hurt two weeks into the NFL season. Ben Simmons is marvelously talented, but seems very, very soft, whether it be physically or mentally, is going to get traded by the Philadelphia 76ers. What they can get for him in return, who knows? They're going to probably hold out to get as much as they can. He's a young player. He signed for four more years. So he is an asset. The problem is... Where is he going to fit? But I, I think what's going to happen is training camp is going to start. He's not going to show up. And sooner rather than later, they're going to have to decide to move on, get some assets for him, and then go from there. And then see where he ends up, most likely in the Western Conference with Golden State, Minnesota, Portland, You know, pick whatever team out there. So uh, it, it's not a good situation, but they had themselves to blame for this because they they actually lowered the asset the value of the asset by criticizing him so heavily after game seven. You know, if, if, if your own coach and teammate are shitting on you, what do you think the rest of the league thinks? Yeah. I, you know, I definitely think the Sixers deserve a large portion of the blame w- without a doubt. Um, but Ben Simmons deserves just as much uh, in my sure. opinion, not, not just because of his play, which was horrible in the playoffs, but because, like you said, Seb, this is just this is very sensitive behavior that, you know, you, it, there are sensitive players in the NBA, without a doubt. We've talked uh, at length about those those guys on the Nets. Uh, most of them. Most yeah. most NBA players are sensitive. But th- this is this is a, a unique situation that's gotten particularly bad, particularly fast because of basically uh, one day of comments, you know, about Ben Simmons for the for the. For the large portion of Ben Simmons' career, he's been just built up by the 76ers and their fans and Joel Embiid and Brett Brown before Doc Rivers. And Doc Rivers, when for the most part in the regular season and up until the game they were eliminated, they were just praising Ben Simmons. And so I, I do feel like it's a little unfair for Simmons to be this reactionary to what was essentially a... A, a very honest and blunt without thinking assessment of his play immediately after getting eliminated from the playoffs. Right. It's not like doc rivers was asked this, you know, a week after, what do you think of Ben Simmons? I'm sure he would have had a better answer, but sort of in the moment, it's hard to kind of calculate, okay, is this going to hurt my player's value? Is this going to hurt his feelings? You know? So I, I think that's a little bit difficult and all because of, you know, the immediate reaction upon being eliminated by the Hawks Ben Simmons has decided to completely torpedo his value and his relationship with the 76ers to the point where he's made it very difficult for them to trade him. The situation, if he does in fact want to be traded, and I've said this before, Sap, many times, I don't think players understand this. If you really want to be traded, the best way to do it is to not go really public and scorched earth with your trade request because that makes it harder to be traded because that hurts your value and the teams inherently don't want to lose value on a trade. So him not showing up to camp and him continuing to, I guess, uh, have this 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 perception that he doesn't care about basketball or he's a sensitive player. 
all it's doing is making it harder for him to get out of Philadelphia. And I'm not sure that him or Rich Paul, his agent, are are going about this the right way if he truly wants to be traded as soon as possible. I think had he just said privately, trade me, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do this and not gone as public with it, he may have been traded by now. Yeah, those are great points, Jeff, because, again, his value keeps going down. And then management led by, you know, um, Daryl Morey, they're going to want to get as much as they can for him. Now, what's worse, the way Ben Simmons has handled this or the way that James Harden handled it last season when he shows up to training camp, you know, looking like a Macy's Day float uh, and then forcing his way out of Houston. He got his wish. He got out of Houston. Houston didn't get as much back in return. And the, the strange thing about these deals, Jed, is it, it never works out where it's a one for one trade. We talked a couple of weeks ago that um, incredible trade, you know, it would be the biggest trade in NBA history would be Ben Simmons for Kyrie Irving. Of course, Kyrie Irving said if he was traded by the Nets, he'd retire, which I can buy into that. That's the thing about totally. Kyrie Irving. I think totally. that threat would, would not be idle. I think that that could happen. So that's not going to happen. That's just obviously fantasy. But, you know, that's what we do here at times. But you you basically see, you know, three quarters, two dimes and a nickel for a dollar. So, you know, whoever's going to get Ben Simmons is going to give up some draft capital, some young players, uh, maybe a veteran. So the contracts all work. So that's what the 76 are going to have to do. They're going to have to be pragmatic about this. The guy doesn't want to play there anymore. So you know, Ben Simmons has already banked a lot of money. It's not like, you know, he's going to miss a mortgage payment or have his cable shut off. You know, he could sit out if he wants. And at some point it would get resolved and he'll go play somewhere else. Um, this is an ugly situation. And Philadelphia is going to have to make the best of the situation as they can, because, you know, you've got Joel Embiid, you've got some nice pieces. If you want to be a true contender, you got to get, even if it's 75 cents on the dollar in return, you got to go ahead and do that because the player's not going to play there. Yeah, obviously, they're never going to get, you know, one for one value. They're not right. going to be able to get an equal asset in return. I mean, that ship has, has long, long, long since since sailed. Uh, I don't even think they can get 75 cents, Sap, on, on the dollar. Yeah, that's, that's pushing I mean, it. You're right. That, that is asking a lot right now. You, you know, the, the issue is, and comparing this to the Harden trade last year is interesting because once Harden decided he wanted to move on, Houston didn't have any other pieces to really be competitive anyways. So they could go full tank mode and they knew they were going to compete for a championship. Had they decided to get other assets, they they could have gotten, you know, better players than they gotten, but they would have been a middling Western conference team as opposed to, you know, a team that's completely restarting. And now they have Jalen green and it looks like, you know, the process is, is starting in in Houston. It's going to take a while, but they picked the direction. At least The, the, the Sixers are in a different situation where they have Joel Embiid who at times looked like the surefire MVP last year before he missed a bunch of games, they're they're not going to be okay with restarting and resetting everything because they have him. If they were resetting, it would be more likely that they trade Joel Embiid than Ben Simmons because that's more of a, a, a reset situation. So right. Harden had the advantage of saying, or the Rockets had the advantage of saying, okay, at least we can have a clear-cut direction here. I don't think that they necessarily made a great trade but they at least picked a, a, a lane with with philadelphia the lane is is clear as long as Embiid there is try to compete but when you're talking about getting 50 40 30 cents in the dollar for what's your second best asset after joel Embiid, it, it's hard to convince fans and management and joel Embiid that you're really doing what's best for the team in terms of trying to put together a winning formula. So there's no, if you're a Sixers fan, unfortunately there's really no good outcome right now in this situation. You're going to get less than what you ever would have imagined for Ben Simmons. And the team is probably going to be, I'd say significantly worse. I, I just don't see how they can come out of this situation unless we didn't know about some really awful chemistry stuff between Simmons and Embiid that was bothering the team throughout the season. It didn't seem Which that I think way. It could be absolutely a case though. I mean, I don't think those two guys like each other. Didn't we hear a story that they uh, went to the all-star game in separate jets? Like, you know, the, instead of going in the same chartered jet as two teammates would do, oftentimes they decided to go on their own, Right. I mean, not necessarily their private jets, but, they, but I mean, they, Sap, they had the best record in, in the Eastern Conference in the regular season. So I'm saying, did it really affect them that much in the regular season to the point where, you know, the chemistry? No, but it was did in the postseason, though. 
it did in the postseason, and one guy shut it down, and the other guy, you know, blamed the other guy, but the guy who blamed the other guy also sucked in the fourth quarter of many of the games. So, I mean, it, and then Doc Rivers is not the right coach for this. I mean, I think we've seen over the years that, that Doc Rivers is an overrated coach. He does have a championship, and he's a guy we love. I mean, I love Doc Rivers. I hope he runs for the U.S. Senate at some point. I think he'd be a great candidate. But as a head coach right now in the NBA, he's underachieved, or he hasn't done a really good job because how many times has he lost – leads in series like just it seems like every year there's doc rivers leading three games to one or three games to two and ends up losing a series uh so it's it's not a real good situation there they have to move on from i mean he seems pretty steadfast that he's not going to show up the training camp which is just a week away and then the regular season starts three weeks after that and uh, again maybe you start the season he's not there but at some point you you gotta you know shit or get off the pot and and get what you can. I still think Golden State makes the most sense because they do have some interesting assets that the 76ers can get back. And you would think that Simmons with Clay Thompson and of course Steph Curry would be an interesting team. Yeah, you know, I think that that's obviously the the best situation for Ben Simmons. I don't necessarily know that the Sixers at this point want to send him to a good situation too. I think, you know, there's there's probably some spite in, in it involved right now. Um <laughs> But that's stupid on their part. Don't you get the most you can in return? I mean, I'm sure Houston would have liked to send James Harden anywhere but Brooklyn to give him a chance to win a championship. But that's where he wanted to go. And again, it's it's a player's league. And if you could get the most back from there, you go ahead and do it. You know? Yeah, I don't he, think they did get the most that they could get back. That, no, that I, they didn't. But that, but he kind of said, well, I'm going to Brooklyn. I mean, we heard all these stories that Danny Ainge was involved. Danny Ainge is, you know, was involved in never every trade in, yeah. that ever happened in NBA history, and it just never did anything. Well, well, but Sam- yeah, he, he was going to Brooklyn no matter what. Again, these guys have so much money. Ben Simmons lives in like a $24 million house. I mean, he could just basically say, I'm done for a while. Well, you know, you, uh, tell me when you're, done, when you're ready to trade me. Yeah, you know, as 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 out of shape and, and you know, toxic as, as James Harden was when he was trying to exit Houston, he at least had the, you know, cachet behind him of, you know, I've won an MVP. Mm-hmm. I'm still yep. playing at, you know, the height of my powers. You know, Ben Simmons is coming off of the worst stretch of his career. Um, and so, you know, the value is certainly different there too. And I think the interest from a lot of teams is different. I, that's why I, I, I really criticized the Houston trade at the time was that, you know, I think there were a lot of teams that would have wanted James Harden, even despite sure. the fact that he, you know, he looked like he was, you know, eating it strip club buffets every day uh <laughs> i don't know how many teams really want ben simmons right now i don't know if you know people are beating down the 76ers door with with trade offers certainly doesn't seem that way and now you know i think the situation has the potential to get uglier sap because the sixers are going to be well within their rights and and should uh and i think will just start docking him paychecks and i know that's that's fine because you know simmons like you said has a lot of money but Play, no one wants to just lose money. And he's talking about, they're talking about losing large chunks of money that he can start. They can start once, once uh, preseason starts, start taking away from him. They can find him in the right, in the training camp. And then they can start taking away game checks, start preseason. And that's when the money starts to be big. And if he doesn't show up for 30 days, sap, he doesn't get the year counted uh, on his contract so you're talking about uh-huh. free agency being pushed away another year too so the situation has the the chance to get even uglier and in some ways once you're once you're getting close to that 30 day mark sap that you don't show up and this has never happened before so this is kind of unprecedented situation the team starts to hold a lot of power because you simmons as much money as he has does not want to lose a year of his career counting towards free agency he's got another one or two huge contracts left in sure. him uh and, and you, he doesn't want to be pushed well, further away from that so does he show up if it gets closer to that 30 day mark i i, I really don't know but this is because the chance to get it's ugly now as the chance to get even uglier it could be like Deshaun Watson, where he showed up and said, "Hey, I'm ready to play." It just, you right. know, but I, my, my hamstring hurts or my ankle hurts, and I'm in the middle of some sort of crazy, um, you know, case with with 22 women um, claiming uh, sexual misconduct. So that that was a whole other issue where we don't even heard anything like that with Ben Simmons. He seems like you know a, a decent enough guy off the court. Uh, the the problem with Ben Simmons compared to James Harden is we we've never doubted James Harden wanting to play basketball. Like I think James Harden's a baller kind of reminds me of Paul Pierce, like even out of shape, I think he can still play. I think James Harden, you know, right now is probably playing pickup basketball somewhere with Ben Simmons. I still don't get the feeling that he loves 
the game. And that, that's an issue. You know, when a, when a guy's kind of that uh, laconic, that's a good yeah. word, huh? You like that's that one? Laconic. Yeah, that's a oh, great man. word. That's He's a very laconic. Word. Oh, that's a that's a maybe 75 cents. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think when you just don't know, is this guy eat, drink, sleep, basketball uh, like most of the great players do? Like Kevin Durant, you know, would would play till he's 50 if he's could because he just loves playing basketball. I think LeBron loves playing basketball. I don't get the feeling with Simmons and Kyrie that that's the case. That's why it'd be a great trade. But again, you know, Kyrie would blow it up by retiring and Ben Simmons might retire. Both teams would trade these guys to for each other and both would retire. Wouldn't that be yeah, perfect? Yeah, I, I fully believe the, that Kyrie threat, uh, by the way. Sure. I know you said so earlier. I, I think that's 100 percent true. Um, and yep. Another theory being th- floated out there, Sap. Uh, this is from uh, NBC uh, Sports from their basketball site. Um, that Simmons could, in order to avoid those fines, go that I need to have surgery route, you sure. know, and say, "Oh, well, you can't find me." You know, I was doing something because this has been hurting me. I'm I'm missing time because of an injury. So he could go that route too. That would probably be litigated between the the team and uh, again. It's ugly now, Sap. It has the potential to get way uglier than this, which is kind of hard to believe, but it really does. Yeah, I mean, is he going to go the Scotty Pippen method where, okay, I'll just wait till the season starts to have my off-season surgery, so it's no right. longer an off-season surgery. But do the Philadelphia 76ers want to run their business like that? Because, again, it is a player's league. If you really play hardball with Ben Simmons, at that point, you're no longer a free agent destination. Not that Philadelphia is a great free agent destination kind of has a feel like Boston where players don't want to play in the cold old cities of the Northeast. Although they do have Joel Embiid, who you would think would attract some free agents, but do you really want to do business like that, especially with a clutch client, right? And clutch sports is the most powerful agency in the sport. Do you want to start pissing them off at that point? It's a delicate situation for Daryl Morey. He's going to have to make the proverbial chicken salad out of chicken shit. Yeah, you know the the trade that I I think has, is hysterical that's that's being kind of floated now because the situation with the Rockets is that they're not going to play John Wall at all because they're you know rebuilding and they want to lose games and have to play the young players and he doesn't help them do that similar to what the Al Horford situation was in Oklahoma City last year I don't understand how the league allows that but that's another podcast for another day um, I think John Wall playing actually helps you lose. It may be, but that's, that's I've me. heard this floated out there, the Simmons for John Wall swap, which would be taking basically two cents on the dollar for Ben Simmons. You know, no offense to John Wall. I know he averaged 20 points a game last year, but he's always hurt, and his contract is horrible, but the money works. Could you see that happening? Yeah, that would that would be wild, wouldn't it? The, the funny thing is about the NBA jet is any trade's possible. You know, I sound like Kevin Garnett here. Anything's possible because – Anything could happen. Like the Kyrie Ben Simmons trade is most likely not going to happen. But at some point, Ben Simmons is going to get moved. And for what, we don't know. And we shouldn't be surprised when it happens because that's the way the NBA works. Yeah, that would be, you know, uh, again, John Wall. I've never been a big fan of his now that he's, you know, in his early 30s. The athleticism is gone. Uh, He's kind of a poor man's Russell Westbrook, an elite athlete who, you know, uh, plays his ass off. But once you start to lose that athleticism, your numbers go down and your productivity goes down. So, yeah, I mean, that that you'd be trading bad contracts for bad contracts. Um, But Simmons, again, is so unique because he's so young. Right. I mean, like and, and he appears to have gotten through whatever injury concerns he had early in his career. It's been pretty durable the last three years, I would say. So, yeah, no, it's, you know, it's mental a, concerns with him. It's not it's, it's mental concerns, which, again, you can't really deal with. Like you can look at someone's like Kevin Durant, you know, has an, an Achilles injury. You go, OK, we're going to repair it and he'll be back in 18 months. And he's as good as ever with, with the mental part of it. You can't really quantify that. You can't really put your arms around that. Yeah, I think that's, you know, the really hard thing for teams, too, who are going to be trading for Ben Simmons. And that's why they don't want to give up, you know, a huge asset for him. It's it's a hard sell fan bases. His value's at an all-time low. And I don't know how many teams feel like, okay, we can definitely get through to this guy because they don't know him. You know, it's it's a weird situation where I think they look at it and say, okay, he was on a team with legitimate championship potential and aspirations in Philadelphia – and they, up until the last game of their season, 
all he did was build this guy up and he still wasn't able to deliver or willing to shoot threes or willing to go to the free throw line or at the end of it, shoot layups. Uh, right. You know, is there any way anybody can get through to him? I, I think that's a fair question. And, and that's a really, really hard thing to, to sort of say, okay, we're going to pull the trigger and trade for this guy. Like you said, Sap, you can get the medicals on guys and feel good or bad about the medicals. You know, those are, you know, swapped around like trading cards in the NBA. Uh, you know, th- should that be the case? Probably not, but that's just how it is. Uh, with this, I-, I don't know how you how you make the determination of, okay, we can get through to Ben Simmons and improve him as a player and get this mental block out of him. There's no, it's, you're taking an inherent risk. Oh, without question. And then you're committed for four years, $175 million, whatever the contract is. And look, he could mail it in for four years, collect all that money, and then right off on into the sunset at that point. I mean, there would be obviously some method for the team to push back on that. And and look, if the guy shows up and, and isn't holding up his end of the bargain, that that's obviously an issue. But again, it is a player's league. This is more so than in any other league in, in sports. I mean, Major League Baseball's kind of the same thing where there's guaranteed eight, 10, 12 year contracts. I mean, their contracts are longer. Uh, this is, doesn't generally happen in football, but we're even seeing it happen in football with quarterbacks, you know, they're pushing the envelope and, and requesting trades or requesting management to do things differently. You know, so it's player empowerment, which I'm for, I'm totally for player empowerment, but you know, at this point, Ben Simmons, again, like you said, at least, James Harden had some sort of track record of accomplishments. Ben Simmons, it's more about potential than what he's actually accomplished so far. Right. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's weird. It's like almost like both Ben Simmons and the Sixers are holding each other hostage at this point yeah, right it's now. True. It's true. It, it's like the, neither one is, is neither one is getting anything that they want. Um, and neither one of them is, is making the situation any easier on the other one. So it, it's a, it's a fast, it's a fascinating situation and it's a ugly situation, but I think every fan outside of Philadelphia is looking at it and saying, okay, this is really interesting to watch. I am excited to see how it plays out. I'll call my shot right now. Sap. I, I think he's going to go to the Spurs. That's, that's my guess. I think that's they think they, they could recoup value for him. I think the Spurs have enough interesting young to veteranish players that they could put together a package that the stick that the Sixers could go. At least we could plug some of these guys are in. Maybe they could help us a little bit, you know, but that that's my prediction. I, whatever they get the, the Sixers, it's not going to be what it was going to be, you know, six, seven months ago. Uh, it's right. going to be far, far worse than that. So I, I'm just going to predict that again, at this point, it seems like no team would surprise me, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll call a shot on what's today, the 21st of September, and say he ends up in San Antonio. Yeah, I'll go with Golden State. So we know he's going to the Western Conference. That's mostly, that's most likely. And he stated he wants to play in California, whether it be the Lakers, Clippers, Kings, or Warriors. I don't think the, well, maybe the Kings could be in play if they decide they want to move some of their young assets. Why not? The Lakers just don't have the no. assets, unless, you know, were they going to trade nine guys that they signed in the offseason for Ben Simmons? That's not going to happen. The Clippers, other than Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, what, what exactly are they going to trade of anywhere near equal value to for Ben Simmons? Yeah, the Spurs, that's an interesting one. Yeah, and, and here's the thing, you know, Rich Paul and Clutch, that's obviously Ben Simmons' rep, uh, representation, and they've had a good, they've done a good job of getting their clients to where they want to go. The difference is Ben Simmons, his value is not at an all-time high like Anthony Davis's value was mm-hmm. when he wanted to get traded to the Lakers. Also, Anthony Davis had you know shorter years on his contract, and Ben Simmons just signed a new deal, so he's got long years on his contract, and his value is low. So uh, the Sixers, I don't think, could give two shits where Ben Simmons wants to be traded. Right. They're going to trade him wherever they think they can maximize you know the value. And and frankly, if that happens to not be in California, I all the better for the Sixers. So, you know, I think they'd love to stick it to him too. So uh, we'll, we'll see. Again, I, I'm interested to see where it plays out. But um, I, as far as where he wants to go, I, I think it's it's irrelevant at this point. Yeah, I mean, Denver is also an option because we've talked about them. Michael Porter Jr. would be an interesting piece. Then you'd have an incredibly great passing team, right, with Ben Simmons. Yeah. And Nikola Jokic, uh, you know, it would be uh, kind of a strange team, but it would certainly be interesting. Um, obviously, 
uh, Jokic is not a great defender and Simmons is, it might be an interesting mix with the two of those guys. And if you could surround them with some shooters, it'd be interesting, but I think something's going to happen. Philadelphia just can't sit tight and hold on to the guy. They at some point have to do something with them and, and get the best deal they can it, for them. They want to see at least if two, three, four teams are interested and then they can play each other off of it. And as long as he doesn't, jump in and say, well, I'm not going to San Antonio or I'm not going to Denver or I'm not going to Minnesota. I want to go to California. And, you know, obviously that limits the options for Philadelphia. Yeah. I mean, he's, he could do that certainly, or he could threaten retirement too, but uh, uh, he's leaving a lot of money on the table in in that case. And uh, he still has, like I said, several big contracts left in his career. So I don't know if he is going to play that game. But it is an interesting situation, and I, we're obviously going to keep a close eye on it. And the second something happens, we'll, we'll be talking about it and breaking it down for you uh, on the show here. Um, in other NBA news, while Ben Simmons is still in the middle of his career, uh, J.J. Redick is calling it an end to his career. The sharpshooter out of Duke is retiring. Um, he announced it on, uh, on his podcast and on his social media. 37 years old. Um, Interesting career for J.J. Redick, who came out extremely hyped out of Duke, one of the greatest players in college basketball history, I'd say, certainly one of the greatest Mm -hmm. players in Duke history, um, and struggled to get his footing in the NBA and then eventually did and became one of the most prolific three-point shooters that we've ever seen. Sort of, Sap, what are your thoughts about J.J. Redick's career? Yeah, I mean, when he came into the league, he was one of the most disliked, despised players because of Duke. Like Duke has had more dickheads than any other college program without a in basketball history, right? I mean, you start with Christian Leitner, you go to JJ Redick. I mean, Kyrie Irving fits the Grace narrative and Allen. beautifully. Grace and Allen, yeah, just to go right on down the list. Bobby Hurley, not so much. Again, I think Bobby Hurley because he got in that car accident as a rookie. Um, when he was in the NBA, he became kind of a sympathetic figure. I mean, Grant Hill, everybody kind of likes and respects, although some people think he's Mr. Goody Two Shoes and, and think he's phony. Um, I think Shane Battier got on people's nerves. He did, yeah. I mean, because the Duke guys think they're smarter than everyone because they went to Duke. I think Zion has a chance to be the one Duke player that everybody kind of loves because of his personality. So J.J. Reddick comes into the league as probably after Christian Leitner, the second biggest dickhead in Duke history. And by the end of his career, he became kind of popular, right? Because he did this really good podcast. He's a smart guy. He's interesting. He's got the family. And and the funny thing is, is that he, he had some really good years late in his career. Only three years ago, he averaged 18 a game with Philadelphia. And it was a 40% three-point shooter. I also think he's a guy that if he'd come into the league 10 years later, he would have been a bigger star or been a star at least because of his three-point shooting. I mean, when he first came into the league, it wasn't, as three point happy as it is now, now it's a three point shooting league. You know, if he had been in his prime, you'd be looking at a guy who'd be, you know, top five, top 10, three point shooters. He came into the league a little bit too early to, to kind of catch that fire, but uh, interesting career. His podcast is excellent. I also think he, if he wants to could get hired by ESPN or TNT, I think he'd be a great studio guest. I don't know about as an in-game analyst, but I think as a studio guest, ESPN should probably reach out to him. I think it would be pretty fascinating. Yeah, uh, very popular amongst players, too. Yeah. Uh, the players yeah. all seem to really like him. Uh, when he was, I remember when he was uh, on the Magic, was it on the, or the no, it was the Sixers. Sorry, mm-hmm. and uh, Markel Fultz was struggling. He was, you know, criticizing the media, saying, you know, he's a young kid, he'll figure it out, leave him alone. I think he's a, it was a very popular teammate and I agree with you, Seth. I think, I don't think he ever would have been necessarily star player, but uh, certainly a hotter commodity had he come into the league a little bit later and probably Mm -hmm. his scoring would have been up, but he ends his career 15th all time in terms of made threes. Um, His three point percentage uh, for his career 41, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. Uh, Only two players have matched that combination of three pointers made and three point percentage. Those are Steph Curry and Kyle Korver. Um, you know, Kyle Korver, another similar player in, in a lot of ways to JJ Redick, I would say uh, similar careers yeah. in a lot of ways. A um, little you know, bigger who- player, a little bigger player came into the league a little earlier, but yeah, very, very similar players without question. Guys that you were obviously liabilities defensively, but on offense, they could really spread the offense for you, really spread the floor and, and, you know, be effective with guys that can drive and dish, but very nice career for um, JJ Redick. And I I think he's going to do well on TV if he so chooses. 
yeah, and his podcast is is popular too. So I, I think he'll be able to make plenty of money uh, in his retirement. He obviously retires without winning a championship, which I'm sure bugs him. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, not everybody can win a championship. That's no. that's how it goes. Finishes his career playing for the Magic, one year for the Bucks, a couple of years for the Clippers, the Sixers, the Pelicans, and then last year he played on Dallas like a couple games. Uh, it was midseason trade and and barely played at all for them. So uh, so happy trails and best of luck to JJ Redick in retirement. I, I agree with you, Sap. I don't think this will be the last we hear of him. I, I feel very confident that he'll either be on ESPN or TNT or or whoever the hell has, you know, games in, in three years, Amazon will probably have all the games. Um, so we'll, we'll hear from JJ Reddick too, but uh, uh, interesting that he's decided to retire. Cause I do think a team would have been willing to sign him maybe mid season, maybe a championship contender, but he's not going to go that route. It doesn't seem. Yeah. I mean, he's got a big family, bunch of kids, and I think he wants to see them grow up and you've put your time in and, and made plenty of money and you've got your future secure. And now you can, do things that you find really fun, like his podcast. If he does TV work, he'll be very good at it. Yeah. A couple last uh, just notes before we, uh, we finish up here, Sap, uh, the Lakers have some, some roster plans that uh, I want to see if you're on board with. Apparently they're planning to play Anthony Davis at the five, a position where he doesn't like to play, but is probably best suited. And LeBron James at the four, um, which I don't even know if you can LeBron James when he's on the court is any position. It doesn't really matter right. um, what you, you call him. Are you on board with this? Yeah, I've always wanted to see LeBron play closer to the basket, you know, so that would take away uh, some of the opposing defenses ways to contain him, have his back to the basket a little bit, whereas passing is even enhanced. Um, you know, we saw Jordan late, later in his career, Kobe later in his career, even Bird and Magic later in their careers play closer to the basket so you don't have to exert as much energy getting there, where obviously he's still an incredible weapon. Anthony Davis, I think he doesn't want to be called a center. And again, we play in an era of positionless basketball. Um, the problem with that is I don't think he wants to cover the bigs, but the bigs now are more perimeter players. I mean, this isn't 19... 19- you know, 88, where you're going up against Patrick Ewing and Hakeem Olajuwon and all those big guys that would play in the low post or Moses Malone beating the hell out of you. It's it's a different sport now. So I think just the idea of being a center bothers Anthony Davis. He likes to be referred to as a stretch four, which is pretty much what he is. But like you said with LeBron, he plays wherever the hell he wants. And and, in the course of a game, he kind of plays all five positions, right? I mean, he's naturally a small forward, but he handles the ball like a point guard Uh, defensively. He can match up against anyone. He can rebound like a four. So he plays wherever he wants. This I think is to try to accommodate Russell Westbrook, which is going to be very interesting fit going forward. So I think they're going to have Russell as the point guard kind of, you know, honor him that way and see where it goes. If it doesn't go well, then, you know, there's other options. The Lakers do have a very versatile team, right? Because they've got, well, they've got a very deep roster and they've got some players that can play multiple positions. So I'm on board with this. I've always wanted to see LeBron play closer to the basket. So I think we'll see a little bit more of that this season. Yeah. Again, just because they're calling him a four, I'm not convinced he's going to play closer to the basket. Sap. I don't think he has it within himself to not control the offense. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's, that's talking about that basketball IQ. I think it just annoys him too much to not do it. He's, he's not a micromanager, but I, I think he knows, okay, I am the smartest player in the court. He's right. right. Uh, except for, you know, when he's on the court with maybe like Chris Paul or something. But for the most part, he's, yes, he's the smartest player in the court no matter what. And I don't think he's comfortable with anybody else making the decisions offensively uh, besides mm-hmm. himself. So I, I, you could call him a four, call him a five, three, two, one. I, I think LeBron's going to be running the offense. I don't think he's, he is going to be able to just sit in the block and say, okay, this is this is where I should be right now. I, I think it would drive him crazy like an itch, you know, that he just has to scratch all the time. So they could say he's going to play a four. I think once uh, once the games start, he's going to be running the offense and we'll see how that works. Yeah, it's kind of like in football. You want Tom Brady running the offense, right? You don't want to have Tom Brady, you know, ceding that control to another player. And obviously in, in football, the quarterback runs the offense. Tom Brady's not going to all of a sudden uh, play tight end or wide receiver at any point in his career, obviously. But yeah, I, I think LeBron is is a control freak. I think he is. Um, 
in a sense, the way Brady is. I think they, they've they earned that right, their accomplishments, uh, their knowledge of their particular sport. And I think it's still going to kind of run through him. It can run through him in, in different ways than just him bringing the ball up to court. It can run through him in the low post. But I think they're doing this just to see what they have in Russell Westbrook. Westbrook is ball dominant. We know that, right? Um, but there could be other ways to get Westbrook going. I, I've always felt Westbrook could also play off the ball and be a slasher. That's where I think he could be very effective. Maybe he's going to be used in that way. I think early in the season, it's going to be interesting to see how the Lakers fit because they've got so many new pieces that they're going to have to figure out what the roles are and, and get that good chemistry going. That could take one, two months before we really get a hold of what they are going to be. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the last note I want to say about this is, is in terms of Anthony Davis playing the five, the, the, only concern I'd have about that, and I do think that's probably what helps the team the most, is if he's going up against bigger guys and he's having mm-hmm. to, you know, play a little bit more physical, which is not necessarily what he's comfortable with. His injury, uh, you know, history come yeah. crops up, and is that a potential problem? Do you want to put sure. him in a position where he's going to be playing against guys who are physically stronger than him um, and wearing him down a little bit? Is that a potential concern about him playing the five? Absolutely, and that's why you have Dwight Howard and. In- to a lesser degree, DeAndre Jordan. I don't even know if he's going to be a factor this year. He's on the Lakers, like just about everyone else. I mean, they have like an endless roster, but you would rather have Dwight Howard going mano a mano against some of the bigger, stronger guys in the league. Let's say you're playing the 76ers. Let's say it's the 76ers and the Lakers in the finals. Do you want Anthony Davis spending his time on defense going mano a mano against Joel Embiid. Maybe you rotate some different guys out there. You put Dwight Howard on him to beat on him. Uh, DeAndre Jordan can use some fouls to, to try to, you know, beat up on Joel Embiid. I don't know if you want to have Anthony Davis trying to guard Joel Embiid and be just a bigger, more physical athlete. So yeah, I agree with that. Davis is still so good at facing the basket, you know, as a guy that's six foot 11, he falls in love with his three point shooting a little bit, too much for my liking, but you know, it is a three point shooting league, but he's also very effective with his back to the basket. I think the whole thing with Anthony Davis, no matter what you do with him, he's an exceptional player. From what I understand, he's taking nutrition a lot more seriously this off season and conditioning a lot more seriously this off season. That's the most important thing. You know, if he's a healthy player for this season, you know, that's how much stronger the Lakers are going to be because he's, he's a top five, top 10 player easily provided he's on the court. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, he, he, he should be without a doubt. Um, yeah. and so he's just the availability is the biggest question for Anthony yep. Davis. And that's, that's what it's been for most of his career. So we'll see if, uh, if he's able to stay healthier. I know Sap that you, uh, you were saying, you know, about conditioning with him and he supposedly has been working on that a lot this off season. We'll, so we'll see if that's actually true or, uh, or not, but, uh, we have, again, training camps are rapidly approaching and the season is rapidly approaching, so all this stuff we'll, uh, we'll find out pretty soon. And that's going to do it for us here on the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap. Again, we're presented by Full Press Coverage. You can find our show anywhere podcasts are found. Just type in Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap. And you can check out our show updates and other opinions on lots of other things on our Twitters. Saps is at John Sap 25 mine is at Jet Stryer. And if you're not watching the show on YouTube, it is on YouTube at youtube.com slash Jet Stryer. Talk to you later, everybody. See ya.